So let's get started. We've been going over spiritual formation for quite some time now, and, and I want to kind of encompass everything that we've been bringing and, and kind of fine-tune it and also touch base and, and kind of enforce and enhance some of the things that we've been um, learning in here. Is, is, is if it comes down to it, all of it, it it's the cent- is Christ at the center of life. That you yourself would be made in your creature and Christ will live in you and everything revolved around your life is going to be centered around Christ. It's something that as we progress, we, we, we begin to realize that, you know, some of you guys come to Christianity and come to know Christ and it's kind of like added to your life. Um, there's this term in psychology called we compartmentalize, meaning that we put into a category or we divide into sections our lives. So you think of your life as a, a, a full circle. And you're in the center and, and everything around your life is, is in that, everything. And there's different bubbles, different sizes. What you lean more towards is going to be the biggest bubble in your life. For quite some time, academics was very much my biggest Part of my life. It was the biggest circle in my life. I was going to LEBI, I was going to Cal Baptist, and school was just so much the center of my life that Christ was there, but kind of like onto the side. So in your life, think to yourself, maybe perhaps it's work that you're putting before Christ. Maybe it's family. I guess some people, man, it's family first, and then it's church, and then it's God. What in your life are we carpamentalizing and dividing into sections or categories that God is just, he's there. We're all Christians in here. I hope so. We're all believers. But is Christ the center of which everything around us is perceived and learned through and, and moved through, through Christ? So something that's very radical in our minds. As we come to Christ, it's no longer an add-on, but it's, it's a shift. Paul talks about this in Romans, having a renewing of our mind, looking at things through the lens of God, meaning majority of us are, are either going to be influenced by our culture or influenced by our creator. That's going to be the difference. Is your surrounding going to influence you or is your creator going to influence you? And then we're going to be talking about different aspects of how this pours into. We're going to be talking about God, ourselves, um, the world, and believers, that's, that's kind of what everything else falls into that place. We have to learn that, that Christ has to ultimately just reign as lordship over our lives. Ultimately, that's what it comes down to. Some of us, we, we're Christians, and maybe we resist his authority, his rule. We, 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 we don't really submit ourselves fully to all the areas of our lives. Some people... Whatever it may be, your finances, your work, your family, your relationships, we neglect some part of our lives that we are not entrusting fully over to God because God has been carpamentalized into a portion of our life and not encompassing the full circle of who we are in our being, in our existence, that he is the we are created. Really quickly, I wanted to read two verses before we get into the four major points, which we will probably only cover the first two today. Um, but Romans eleven thirty six. For, for from him and through him all, and for all and for him all things to to be, the glory of God forever. If you could please put that up there, Romans eleven thirty six. For from him and through him and for him all are all things. To be, to him be the glory forever. So everything is for the purpose of God. Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through him who gives me strength. And everything that you are and whatever you struggle in whatever areas, everything starts at the center point of your life with Christ. As we've been going over the, the past few months in spiritual formation, and obviously we never stop that because we are continuously being formed in our spiritual selves, but it has to start with Christ being at the center. So we're going to look at, at, at four aspects, but we'll focus on two today. We're going to look at our relationship with God and then our relationship with ourselves. So in the first point, with our relationship with God, we're going to be fine-tuning some things that we've been learning in here. So the, the first part of our relationship with God is our image of God. How well can you know yourself is really how well do you know God. 
much too many times we limit our knowledge of God. We don't want to be in here and just kind of like whimsically looking over things, just faintly not really diving into who God is and, and what he is. So now if you guys can follow me to Matthew chapter 11, verse 27. Matthew chapter 11, verse 27. And we, we spoke about this a couple weeks ago, about the image of God. It's fine-tuned by knowing his personhood. We know him by his love, his mercy. We know him by his powers, his omniscience, his, his omnipotence, everywhere he's all-knowing, and his perfections through his law, his word. But let's read Matthew 11, verse 27. All things have been committed to me by my, by my father. No one knows a son except the father, and no one knows a father except the son to whom the son chooses to reveal him. So if you choose to know God, you have to know God through his son. Because that is the very revelation of God, how he's revealing himself to humanity over time in the, in, in the, in the, in the Old Testament was through, you know, the Moses, the, the, the law. We have that. And then we have the prophets. God is telling his people who he is by using prophets. The word, communicating to his people. And all of this is, is the greatest revelation of God revealing himself to you is through Christ. That is the ultimatum. That's the climax of the story. That God would come into earth through his son and, and reveal who he is. Speak with us. Live amongst us. Fully man and fully God. That he would pay himself as a substitute for, for, for the wrath that we have over our lives. And I wanted to read this in context. Man, do I love just reading some more verses when I, when I dive in this. So let's go up to verse 25, and then we'll, we'll read through it. And at that time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and, and learned and revealed to them to little children. As boastful as you can be in your knowledge of understanding reality and everything, you're always going to be... So limited. And God would, would kind of shame the wise. Oh, you boasting yourself, thinking you know it all. Yeah, I reveal myself to little kids in the, in, in, in innocence of their knowledge and, and who they are. That God would be made so simply to them. 26. Yes, Father, for, for this is what you were pleased to do. All things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father. And no one knows the Father except the Son. And those whom the Son chooses to reveal him. 28, come to me, I love this portion, come to me all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for, for my yoke is easy, my burden is light. So here God is revealing himself to the people that they think they know it all, shaming them, saying, oh, well, you, 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 you don't know all this. And then when God reveals to himself, he tells them, take my yoke upon you and learn from me that my burden is light. Something that we have to understand about the yoke. How many, if you guys don't know what a yoke is, it's, it's, a, it's like a, a wooden piece, uh, kind of like a, like a little cross that goes over two animals and they plow the crops. So us, when we think about our yoke, it's, it's our obligation, something that we have in our work, something that we carry. And in the ancient times with the Jews, the, the yoke was referenced as an obligation to God. So when they say, well, this is my yoke to God. This is my yoke to my work. This is my yoke to the law. This is my yoke to my faith. Very much your obligation. And then he tells them, take up my yoke. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Something that we're looking with, that we're constantly looking for, that people probably don't even know, but, but something that we find in Christ. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So our image of God, because we're talking about our relationship with God, is very much shaped and fine-tuned by, by Christ. Knowing how he is, knowing how he reveals himself through his word, in prayer. And, 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 and that's how we, we, we build our relationship. Because Christ is going to be at the center of our lives. 
And then from there, it's how we look up, up, look up onto God, our perspective of God. Because if you look through it through a secular perspective, you're going to get lost. People try and read the word and it doesn't make sense to them because Christ isn't at the center of their lives. Simply said, you can try and search and find solutions for your, for your spiritual selves in the world, but it's always going to fall short. The only thing that I've found and has been revealed that's most satisfying, stable, and, and sufficient is the Lordship of Christ, it is the Scriptures. So we, our image of God is fine-tuned through Christ. The second point under relationship with God, it's cultivated by the Word. The logos, the, the, Greek word for the, the Greek word for word, logos. The logos of God, the very word of God is revealed through his scriptures, which is the primary vehicle for God's revelation of, his, of himself, his plan, his purposes. When we look to God, you understand more about him, what he's trying to do, what, what, what his purposes are. You have to read his word. He's speaking life into you when you read the Bible. And man, the people have tried to like, I don't know, when you look at the whole Bible in its entirety, the canon, the, the, the entirety of what encompasses the whole Bible, it's so consistent that over so much amount of time, over the thousand years, the Old Testament, then going into the New Testament, into the first century church, how consistent is it? That it wouldn't contradict itself. But God is, is, is revealing himself in the word. Let's go to Luke 24, 27. When you, when you have it, please say amen. And, it's, and it reads, And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all scriptures concerning himself. So in the things of God, how you know of God, about God, forming your idea of God is all revealed in the scriptures. Obviously, we contextualize this to when it was written. You have the physician, Luke, the gospel, Luke, telling these people. Because people are questioning things. Oh, well, what of this of God? I and mean, I kind of want to read this in context. Let's go up to um, 27. Yeah, let's read this. This is, this is good. So let's go, so just to give a little preface to what's happening here. So we have Jesus, he, he's been resurrected, you know, now he's going to appear himself to some people. And these are some, some, some women that are walking uh, uh, to, to Jerusalem. And we'll read at 17, Luke 24, 17. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk? They stood still with their faces downcast, you know, sad. One of them named um, Cleopas asked them, are you, the one, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know of the things that have happened here in these last days? You guys remember uh, Resurrection Day, Easter, right? We all kind of looked into what happened in that time. And Jesus, you know, he says, what things, he asked. About Jesus and Nazareth, they replied. And look and read and how much they know about what, what significance of the things that are happening in Jerusalem. And he replied, oh, the... the the, the, the lady replied, uh, he was a prophet, powerful in the word and deed before God and all people. The chief priests and the rulers handed him over to, the, to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one that was going to redeem Israel. Kind of like a king. And, oh, man, our king is dead now. And what is more, it's the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of the women amazed us that they went to the tomb early in the morning, but they didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. 24. Then some of the companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. 25. He said to them, how foolish are you and slow to believe all the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and enter, enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and the prophets, he explained to them what was, what was said in all scriptures concerning himself. 
So it's like me talking to you guys. You guys come to church. You know about this just as much as these ladies know about the, the scriptures. Yet he's trying to tell them, like, dude, is it not clicking in your head? That it's plainly said and simple enough as if you were just to open your Bible and just read. It says here he's revealing himself to you through his scriptures. Let's see what 28 says. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on and if he were going further, but they urged him strongly, stay with us for it is nearly evening and the day is almost over. So he went uh, in to, to stay with them. So, sorry, I know sometimes I like to read for context for, 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 for some of the things that we talk in here. It's just to dig a little bit deeper that we wouldn't just read something, be informed, but we would have, be intent in the way we read things and understand what does this mean for us? When God is revealing himself through scriptures. Go with me to Hebrews 1 through 3. Because God's revelation in his son was a climax to his, his self-disclosure to us. And we read that in Hebrews 1, 3. So God is revealing who he is through his word, through his son to us. In Hebrews chapter 1. I like how they just start Hebrews with this so, so boldly and like kind of in your face to the Hebrews, the ones that have received the word of God through the prophets. And he straight tells them in the very beginning of their letter, in the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times in, ver in various ways. But in these days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through him also he had made the universe. The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. You see how our image of God and what he is is so close to our image and our understanding of Christ? So for us to know God, we need to have Christ in us through his spirit. It's so important that when we look to God, have a correct theology an orthodox, a correct view of how we look at God. And I, I struggle with this sometimes with the young people because their idea of God is so foreign by the culture, their, their ambience, their environment. They let the world tell them what God is. Some people tell them, hey, man, you're God. You're in control of your own life. Everything's relative. That what you do is your truth, and, and this is my truth, so don't mess with that. And, and you're in your bubble, and then we compartmentalize Christ into a section of our life. Dividing him, putting him there, instead of it being contrary and putting, this, putting him at the center. Let's read three again. The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the, ma of the majesty in heaven, providing salvation. After he did that on the cross, he spoke, he revealed himself, resurrected, and then he went and sat down at the right hand of God. But here it's telling us, man, the radiance of God's glory is, is through Christ. And for us to perceive and understand God, we need to have Christ in us. So that's the second part of our relationship with God. The first one was with our image of God. And then the second was God revealing himself through his words, so our image and word. The third part, which I gave a pretty good lesson about, this is prayer life. God reveals himself through his prayer life, through the discipline of prayer is how we communicate with God, is which is how we come to know God and understand who he is. So when you plug in all these three aspects into your, your relationship with God, man, is it not a strong fortress that's protected, covered uh, under God's sovereignty, under God's control, under his supremacy. That we understand, and I'm trying to form this so clearly in your head, because I know it's some of it's probably like a little recap of what we've been learning, but it's for you to, to reinforce it in your head so when you go and become good, mature Christians, that you wouldn't be shaken. But we read this in John 15, 7. <clears throat> and it's short. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done to you. This is in John chapter 15 where it talks about 
Jesus being uh, uh, Jesus being the, the, the tree and us being the branches, that we remain in him, in his presence. We're not going to desire the things of the world. That's our flesh desiring those things. But when you're of God and you have Christ in you, man, you just desire some peace in your heart, some tranquility, some good sleep, man, just some joy, some harmony, some protection over your life, God, and, and the things of this world, you, your perspective begins to change, which is implied through prayer life. Hebrews 4.16, and we've gone over this as well. In Hebrews 4.16, let us approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. We approach God. If you guys have a problem, why not give it to God? As simple as that. Give it to God. We are all walking in perfections. Why do we have to pretend like we have everything under control? Can we just give whatever struggle, as insignificant can be. Maybe in your hide you blow it up and it's like the entire world is falling apart. And then to other people, oh, there's nothing. You're, 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 you're tripping. Well, give that to God. See if God isn't going to challenge you and speak to you. Implied with all the word and, and, and through prayer and, and understanding how God is and his supremacy, his perfections, his powers. You're going to start to trust and understand that much more. Whatever problem and situations. So that's the first part. That our relationship with God is fine-tuned by our image of God, who he is. Remember, Christ is at the center. It has to be from everything that we read. So when we look unto God, we understand him through his image, how he is, through his word, we read it, and then through communicating, through our prayer life. Now, the second part, our relationship with ourselves. This is going to be really, really important. Because <laughs> how we view ourselves has to be in light of how God views us. It has to. If you view yourself in comparison to how the world views people, man, are you nothing. <laughs> well, we are nothing before God. But if you view it that way, how discouraging can it be? How depressing can it be when you're always trying to compare yourself to the world in unrealistic, um, in unrealistic ways? It's our image of ourselves. We cannot truly know ourselves until we know God. Only... It's the only satisfying resolve for self-knowledge, which is through Christ. Something that's secure, stable, and significant. Go with me to Galatians 2.20. Galatians 2.20. There we go. I have been crucified with Christ and no longer live. Remember, this is a relationship with ourselves how we view ourselves in our image of ourselves. I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So our image of ourselves has to be in light of what Christ has done. We, we look at ourselves as human beings, descendants of Adam, and we look to that past as we once were, inheriting sin, all in our imperfections. But now, Christ has came, now we look forward with a new life, a new birth in Christ. And we carry that in our image of ourselves. That the very Spirit of God will live in us, that we would be new creatures, have new desires, new wants, to serve him. So in tune and in unity with God. This is all laying a bunch of bricks. All the things we've been talking about is laying bricks. I'm laying bricks in your mind of, 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 of a correct theology of your, of, of your Christianity. So that's our image of ourselves. Now we have our inner life. Because that's our image of ourselves, our inner life. Our inner life is our thoughts our mind, our conscience. How, how is that going to be at the center of Christ? How do we have that? 
Because if we don't have that correct in our minds, man, sometimes it's just a quick thought and, and man, you, you fall into sin or you make a wrong choice. But when you have Christ at the center of your inner life, your thoughts, you battle those things. You, you, you engage in spiritual warfare just by you denying yourself. Sometimes you got to tell your mind, no, this is not what I've learned. The mind is trying to convince the flesh of what it wants. Or the flesh is trying to convince the mind of what it wants, which is sin. It's to indulge. Go with me to Isaiah 26. So we need to have our inner thoughts, our minds, need to be submitted to God. If not, man, are we going to, to just fall into the desires of the flesh? But let's go to Isaiah 26, 3. Because some of the inner thoughts that we sometimes struggle with is just having peace in our minds. Peace and harmony. And this is where we read this in Isaiah 26, verse 3. In that day, the song will be sung in the land of Judah. We have a strong city. God makes salvation its walls and ramparts. ramparts. Open the gates that the righteous nation may enter, the nation that keeps faith. Three, you will be kept in perfect peace, those whose minds are steadfast. Steadfast, just think of that firm, firm on your faith. You will be kept in perfect peace, those whose mind are, minds are steadfast, because they trust in you. Four, trust in the Lord forever, for the Lord, for the Lord, the Lord himself is the eternal rock. You will be kept in perfect peace. Finding contentment in your mind that some of these things that you may struggle with, that, that you're divided in much. We're, I'm a walking in my head. Sometimes I'm, I'm so conflicted. But that's when I don't submit my mind and my inner thoughts to the authority and rule of God. I submit that. God, help me in my mind. Help me in the things that I struggle with. In my conscience, God, help me. It's submitted to God. And God's going to keep you in that peace. It says here that the song will be sung. God, you have kept us in perfect peace. There's a fortress. I like how it says here, salvation and its walls and its ramparts. It's a strong city that in your mind it will be protected from any oncoming evil spirit or, or, or anything that's coming to attack you. Because we are in spiritual warfare. You being a Christian is every day you're in spiritual warfare. Not just against the world, but sometimes against yourself against your mind, against your heart, if we have not submitted that over to God. So then we cultivate the inner garden of our heart and our minds by centering them on Christ. I'll read quickly Proverbs 23, 6. My son, give me your heart. Let your eyes delight in my way. Proverbs 23, 26. My son, give me your heart. God is telling you, give me your heart, the inner self of who you are. And that you will delight in my ways and I'll give you that perfect peace and I will protect you. Who doesn't want that? So that's our inner thoughts. We have our image of God because this is our relationship with ourselves. This is our, Im our image of ourselves. This is our inner thoughts. And now we're going to go into our outer lives. Excuse me. Into our outer lives. Because your outer lives, which you are, is a body in this world. And the things you perceive in your existence are through the five senses. Through your taste, your smell, your hearing, your touch, the everyone, your sight. Sometimes, man, we need God to be the center of that as well. Because the world calls us through our senses. And our body knows what it wants. and wants to indulge in sin. Sin is pleasing to the flesh. But to our spiritual selves, it's... It's, it's so shortly lived. First Corinthians. And I'm coming to a close. This is the end of the second uh, part. So we're going over the first two parts, and then the next two parts will be saved for, for, next, for next, um, next Sunday. So First Corinthians 6, 19 through 20. So we're talking about the body. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought with a price, brought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. 
Then Romans 6, 13. Do not offer any part of yourselves to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been, who have been brought from death into life and offer every part of yourselves to him as an instrument of righteousness. When we view ourselves and our bodies, let them be submitted to God and let God use that as an in instrument. Because if it's not going to be used by God, it's going to be used by you and the ego and your own agenda, which is inherently immoral and, 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 and wicked from what the scriptures tell us. Just think to yourself in all honesty, do you think you could be a, a good person without God? I don't know. If you can, that's, it'd be hard to be consistent like that for a little while, but eventually we all fall. Romans 12, 1. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. So in our relationship with ourselves, when we look at our bodies, our outer body, our outer life, as we are agents, instruments, tools of God, we are used by God. But if they're not submitted to the rule and authority of God, it's going to be a falling point in our lives where it's not all truly submitted to God. So we look to God, we understand who he is, our image is corrected, and our relationship with God, now we fine-tune our relationship with ourselves how we view ourselves, how we view our inner thoughts, how we act in this body that we have in this world. And then for next week, we're going to talk about our relationship with the world and then our relationship with the body, which is the Christ, which is the church. Because that's all we are and everything falls under those four main points. At Christ at the center. We look to God, we look to ourselves, we look at unbelievers and we look at believers. Everything falls in, in that. Who you are, your existence, all of that will fall into those four points. And then they've broken down even further. But we will save that until uh, next week. So let's go ahead and rise and we're going to pray.